Coming up on DTNS, Google kicks free users off its workplace plans. Are they being unfair? Plus, Amazon opens a clothing store and controlling your earbuds with your jaw. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, January 20th, 2022. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about Netflix numbers and mail carrier problems on Good Day Internet. We may have invented a romantic comedy or a thriller. You can find out at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include Dr. X17, Dustin Campbell, and Tim Deputy. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google opened signups for a limited beta of Google Play Games for PC to people in Hong Kong, South Korea, and Taiwan. Beta testers have access to four games initially. Hardware requirements in the beta include a Windows 10 or 11 PC, an 8-core CPU, and select gaming class GPUs, although Google says spec needs will be lower in the future. Twitter will now let you, if you pay for the Twitter Blue subscription, show an NFT as your profile picture. Subscribers to the $2.99 a month service can connect the Argent, Coinbase, Ledger Live, MetaMask, Rainbow, and Trust wallets to Twitter. The Financial Times sources say Meta is also working on a feature for Facebook and Instagram users to let them display NFTs on their profiles. And the Meta team is also working on a way to mint NFTs and has had talks of launching an NFT marketplace all of its own. All these efforts are reportedly in the early stages, except for the Twitter one, which is live. Epic filed its opening brief in its appeal of the September district court decision that the iOS app store does not qualify as an abuse of a monopoly position. The filing in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals makes the argument that the district court erred in its application of antitrust law regarding multiple behaviors, including tying its in-app payment system to distribution in the app store. Epic may look to have the appeals court define the market differently in order to show a broader market dominance by Apple. Ah, round two begins. Mm -hmm. Security researcher Brian Krebs points out that this summer, the Internal Revenue Service in the United States will transition to a new login service for your tax records managed by the online identity verification service ID.me. This will require users to submit copies of identity documents and bills, as well as a live selfie and possibly a live video chat, depending if you have problems confirming your identity, uh, where an actual human will verify you. 27 U.S. states already use ID.me for state benefit sites. A couple of reports on new Google projects. The Verge's sources say that Google is working on its own wire-free AR headset internally codenamed Project Iris that could ship as early as 2024. So not tomorrow, but perhaps in the works. Google's device reportedly uses outward-facing cameras to blend computer graphics with real-world video. And according to emails sent, uh, seen by Bloomberg, Google Engineering Vice President Shiva Kumar Venkaratamon now runs a unit focused on, quote, blockchain and other next-gen distributed computing and data storage technologies within the newly reconstituted Google Labs. All right, let's talk about that clothing store uh, right, right near, Sarah, where we once had a staff meeting. Oh, man. I mean, I used to live not too far away from this, so I would have been excited to play around. Uh, I no longer am in the Los Angeles area, but if you are, Amazon announced it will open a clothing store later this year called Amazon Style at Glendale's Americana Mall. If you're not familiar, it's in a suburban area of Los Angeles. It's sort of an outdoor mall. There's an Apple store there. It's, you know, it's pretty cool. And this is supposed to happen later this year. You can use the Amazon shopping app to scan a QR code to see sizes of things, colors of things, product details of clothing, shoes, and accessories. Then if you want to try an item on, you can send it to a fitting room, get an alert when the fitting room is ready, saying, you know, room 24 is ready for you type thing, or have something sent right to the pickup counter if you're ready to buy and also leave the store. Fitting rooms will be outfitted get it with uh, big touch screens so you can keep shopping from there if you want you can get a different size sent over that type of thing but fitting rooms won't include cameras there was 
some outrage I saw from folks this morning saying, oh, gosh, who wants that in the fitting room? That's not actually the point. The point is no to, one. And it's not that <laughs> is to be able to to order things from the fitting room itself. The store will use real time machine learning for recommendations and Amazon one palm scanning for faster checkout, although will not use Amazon's just walk out technology, at least not at launch, not in the store. No robots yet either. Actual humans will be employed in the store delivering items to fitting rooms managing inventory, answering questions like whether or not you look good in puce. <laughs> By the way, I do not. The idea is to keep the store from getting cluttered. So you got a you know, warehouse in the back, uh, minimal stuff in the front, but if you want something that you don't see, likely it's in the back. So instead of having every size on the rack, you can have one of everything in additional sizes and colors in the back. You can also find items on Amazon itself have them sent to the style store to try on next time you're there. So if you're at home thinking, you know, really want to buy some sneakers on Amazon, the prices are good, but I really got to try them on. If you're in this particular area, that would be a great way to do it. Yeah, I assume that this would be good for returns too. Like, I it, what's funny is my first reaction to this was like, oh, smart experiment, extending clothing buying. Amazon really wants to inc increase clothing buying, uh, and and the one of the holdups is like, yeah, but I want to try it on first. This gives you a place to try it on. But Sarah, you 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 hit on the the way to like crash the system immediately, right? Well, so here, and again, I know this is one store and it's not in an area that I'm in, but it wasn't that long ago that I would have been within reasonable driving distance, you know, maybe 15, 20 minute drive away from the store. And I would have, um, uh, I, I think I would have, um, taken advantage of the idea of like, yeah, I don't want to buy certain things without trying them on this, this works really well, but let's just say that I'm in the market for new running shoes happens a couple times a year. What if I send a bunch of running shoes in my particular size to the store and then I just sort of never go? I wonder how much the warehouse in the back is gonna have to deal with kind of weird inventory that may not apply to the next customer. And to that, I would say it's literally what Amazon does. It is <laughs> the reason why Amazon is a successful company. They did not get big because they sold books and books were something that randomly became the, the uh, uh, basis, the foundation of this massive company. They figured out how they could have enough warehouses that were next to enough publishers and then eventually figure out through algorithmic uh, uh, solutions yeah where to put different things at different times because they can predict the kind of people that would want certain things that will be ahead of the game. So no, yeah, that you're, you're very right. That the said, people. a book does not come in lots of sizes and colors. You get it if you want, right? You know, you know, Trade you have, paperback, you have a little size, inventory paperback. of books that needs to be moved. You know, and, somebody's and, and, gonna get it eventually. And, it's a little different when it gets into like body stuff. Sure, and if they only sold books in the intervening 20 years, I would <laughs> agree with you. They've said sold literally everything that comes in literally every size, shape, or fashion. So I I, I think that that's, that's something that, that Amazon really when you think about them, their real skill is logistics. Mm -hmm. that, that's what they have always been able to figure out, and that's what, that is what separated them. It's not even e-commerce. They're good at e-commerce, but they're not nearly as good as that as they are at logistics. And and I could imagine a, a system where, and I don't know that this is what they're doing, but I could imagine a system where there's a truck going every day, and when you put those 12 pairs of running shoes to, to try on on the store. It tells you, you have 24 hours to get to the store and try them on. Takes them to the store. If you don't pick them up, takes them away. Right, so, right. You know, yeah, it's, it's not gotta be just going like to be that, there right? forever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's very, it's department store-esque. Um, just uh, in Amazon's uh, eyes, a more efficient way to do it. I do, I do think of a world where an Amazon style store or anything that really Amazon sells, but style is a good, uh, a, a really good example of something that it's, it's very personalized, right? You know, I always use shoes as an example because I need them to fit really well. Even if it's my size, still got to try them on, uh, before I'm comfortable buying something. This is great for that sort of thing. Robots being able to get stuff from the back in your size, take it to the fitting room, this is not what they're doing right now, but in the future, I can see where Amazon is like, this is kind of our stopgap thing. Let's see how this works and how we can 
make this a real warehouse situation in the future. Now, that was the, another part of this that I felt was a really good example of what Amazon does well, is they said they're using the same system they use in warehouses to fulfill orders fast to deliver things to fitting rooms. So as soon as the warehouse robots are good enough to do what they're doing in these stores, those warehouse robots are going to show up in the store, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, one last thing on this, I think that it gives them a lot of political leeway that they can hire people that aren't just factory workers or aren't just warehouse workers. Uh, right. The idea that you can get a job with Amazon that is forward facing, it's something that people understand. I don't know if it's a forever solution, but in the near term, it does give them political leverage that there are more than just the peeing in bottles, you know, <laughs> jobs. Right that that uh, are available to you at Amazon. You don't have to be an engineer or a grunt. There, here is a forward-facing retail gig. Also, why not both? Why not robots delivering fast to the fitting room at some point when that gets better, but still humans around to help you out, tell you if you look nice, answer questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've probably heard of algorithms that are trained to recognize photos, you know, algorithms that can tell a cat or a dog or something more useful. Uh, you've also probably heard of algorithms trained to speak in natural language or, or to create texts, but you've probably not heard of algorithms that do all of those things because before this, none of them could. This is the one good reason not to fear that we're too close to general purpose AI that can think on its own. However... Meta AI scientists have developed an algorithm called data to vec that can train a neural network to recognize images, text, and speech all in one. Not three different algorithms, one algorithm that can do it all. data to vec was trained with self-supervised algorithms, which is not, that's not new. That's like GPT-3. Uh, that's where it learns to spot patterns in data sets without needing guidance or labels. The way it is trained, however, I thought was pretty clever. Two neural networks are used, a teacher and a student, a bit like a GAN, uh, if you think of it that way. The teacher network is trained on images or text or speech. So you're gonna have multiple teachers. Pretty normal stuff these days for neural networks to do that. That part's not hard. The student network is not trained on the images, the text, or the speech, but it's trained to predict what the teacher will say. So you're just doing one input for the student algorithm. The teacher network sees an image of a dog and then the student network says, I bet he's gonna say dog. And then the teacher says dog. And there you go. That's how the student network is trained. And that may sound like a distinction without a difference, but it means that the student neural network doesn't need to be tailored to a particular kind of input, but only to predicting what the teacher will say. And eventually it gets good enough, you just take the teacher out of the equation. The way this work means that the student can only be trained on one type at a time, because the teacher can only know one type before it's switched out. But eventually you get there. Data to vec performed a little better than similarly sized existing techniques, around 100 megabytes of data, at images and speech. And it was about the same on text. So a little better on images and speech, same on text. Specialized models may still outperform as they continue to learn uh, because they can have bigger databases. But this is this is a big stepping stone towards generalized intelligence. Certainly doesn't get us there, uh, but but it's a very clever way. And and I think what's significant is that it was a clever moment to say like, yeah, we can only teach it on one input, but what if the input was this? Then the effect would be like we had three inputs. I think I think the idea of. Uh trying to expand the base of how you're programming an AI is, is a really, really interesting idea. And uh, I'm curious to see where it goes. Yeah, yeah, it's good, good, good advance. Hey, any uh, music fans? You guys like music? I like music. Yeah, oh, good. Well, I can only think of one person I know who doesn't like music. <laughs> Who's that? I bet I know who that is. It's Allison. Oh. Well, everybody but Allison likes music, it seems. <laughs> uh, media research estimates music streaming uh, subscribers rose 26.4% year over year, as Q2 of 21 data would tell us, making it easy to listen and control your music experience in a big market. TechCrunch reports on a Paris-based company called WiseEar that just got a round of funding and is now looking for companies to license its hands-free earbuds technology. Wise Ear uses electrodes in an earpiece to detect muscle activity. It's based predominantly on jaw movements. The goal this year uh, for iOS is to perfect two controls. Bite down on your own teeth twice to pause or three times to skip. 
In the next three years, they hope to be able to have 12 different control gestures. The benefit, if they can make it work, is that it isn't affected by noise and requires very little movement and no speaking from the user. Your general movements won't cause accidental activation. It can be useful for hands-free control of music as well as VR and AR headsets. Co-founder Yasin Achik told TechCrunch that Wizeer had an 80% success rate from people who tried it at their booth at Con- Consumer Electronics Show or CES. <laughs> yeah, CES. Heard of it? Yeah. <laughs> it happened. You may have heard of it on the show. Um, Several weeks ago. Yeah, I, I was fascinated by this as a sort of like, oh, yeah, definitely hate using voice controls sometimes. Uh, and and to be honest, there, there are moments when I'm walking a dog and I got a bag of poop in one hand and the dog leash in the other where I can't reach up and tap uh, as easily as I mm-hmm. like or, or at least not comfortably. Uh, and, and so being able to just use like a facial expression or a jaw movement uh, to control like play pause alone uh, would be fascinating. Uh, so I, I know that this company is saying like, look, we're not quite there, but we think we're close. But uh, I would love it if, if this does work and it gets licensed out, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be in line to, to buy one of those earbuds. My first reaction uh, when I read the story this morning was like, <laughs> okay, so I have a teeth grinding problem. You know, I wear a night guard at night. I know I'm not alone. Some of you out there have the same thing. Every time I go to the dentist, they're like, you're going to break your teeth pretty soon. <laughs> like you should be wearing your night guard more often than you are type thing where I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not doing it. So <laughs> the idea of anything that is like, <laughs> that is jaw related to me, I'm like, that's just bad behavior yeah, for you some people. Yeah, you were like, no way. I no way. Yeah, like I'm not I'm not supposed to do that. That's all I think about is not doing that. This is not gnashing of teeth in order right, to like right. skip a song. You know, it's like it's a little <laughs> tap, tap, tap. And I love the idea that for a lot of folks, it's like, wow, it's it's almost like my brain telling you to, you know, mm-hmm. to, to go fr- front or back or pause or that sort of thing. It's not quite that, but it 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 is it is getting there where, like you said, Tom, not using your hands, not using your voice. Um, if if it works as um, as hoped, it is a pretty cool way to almost think something into existence. For me, I still am like mm, no jaw stuff, please. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, yeah. And I, that you've hit it, uh, Sarah. If it works, because the ideal way that this works is that you don't even think of it as tapping your your teeth together. You, it is just an involuntary thing that you do with your jaw. That is the closest thing that triggers it, and and it is not in the same way that you would clack 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 your your teeth together in the way that we are thinking. That being said. I don't know if an 80% success rate is going to get you over the finish line. And no, if that's not yet. their best uh, version of it right now, I think we got some time in the oven on this idea. Yeah. And, and to be, and to be fair in the TechCrunch article, uh, the, the co-founder uh, says like, we're not there yet. We're hoping to get the two perfected this year and then have 12 in the next three years. Uh, I, I thought they were very honest about where they are with it. Uh, but, but I am, I'm hopeful for it because they, what what was genius about the tapping of the teeth uh, it, outside of the jaw concerns is it's not something you would do a lot normally. In, in just talking to neighbors or walking along, you're not likely to do a double tap, right? You might do a single tap of your teeth, but you, you're less likely to do a double. So finding those gestures that you can do with facial movements, you know, squinting where it, or whatever. Where it knows, yeah, yeah you, you actually are talking to me. You're not mm-hmm. just being a human. Yeah, yes. yeah. This but is that's intentional. The Maybe chattering teeth are a problem if you are either very cold or a skeleton. <laughs> Just like autonomous cars. This isn't going to work in the cold. You always forget the cold weather, people. Oh, All right, folks. Uh, if you are uh, in the cold weather and you got something to say about this, or if you're anybody in any kind of weather, join our Discord. You can you can talk to folks in there. Uh, Larry and Atlanta and Zoe Brings Bacon are talking in there right now. You can join them by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Back in 2006, this is the, the Bush administration, all right, 16 years ago. <laughs> Google let users create a domain name based version of its services for free called Google apps for your domain. I did this with subbrilliant.com back in the day. 
That service has had many name changes over the years. Uh, you probably think of it as G Suite, which it still goes by sometimes. Most recently, just in last year, they changed it to Google Workspace. So you'll hear it referred to like that as well. But the, the idea was the service would let you use your own domain name with Gmail and Calendar. So dailytechnewsshow.com for Google services like email, Google Drive, et cetera. In 2012, 10 years ago, this is now the Obama administration, Google stopped offering the service for free 10 years ago and encouraged free users to either pay for a business account or transition to the free versions of its services, which did not allow you to use a custom domain, but they were free. However, Google did not immediately kick the free users off. At the time that they made the change, the paid version was $50 a year. Google, now 10 years later, has finally started to email users of the free service to let them know they will not be able to continue to use it for free. Users have until May 1st to pick a paid version, after which they will be automatically upgraded. If they don't provide payment info, then their account will be suspended after 60 days. But suspension doesn't mean it doesn't work. On July 1st, you'll get 60 more days and on September 1st, if you still haven't paid, you'll lose access to core services, email, calendar, and Meet. But Google says you may still retain access to additional Google services like YouTube and Google Photos through that account. So to sum up, you had almost 10 years to move off. You now have four months to pick a plan, after which Google will pick one for you. Then they'll give you two months to start paying, or they'll limit your account, and two more months before they cut it off, mostly. Now, the plans are not cheap anymore. They're not $50 a year. They're six to $18 per user per month, depending on the features. They max out at 300 users. These are, these are meant for small businesses. If you're bigger than 300 users, you need an enterprise plan anyway. Google is offering a year long discount for anybody making the switch. And if you're done with this, which a lot of people are, and want to ditch all together, uh, you can use Google's data export tool. That however, will not let you export things associated to that account like purchases for books, movies, music, and apps. You may also lose Google Voice, that's unclear. And Google is not providing a seamless way to transition the data to free consumer accounts. It's not immediately apparent how many people are still using the free version of Google Workspace 10 years later. I know there's at least uh, one on our team and uh, a couple in our Discord, probably a higher percentage here in the audience uh, that, than in the general populace. Uh, do we think this is unfair of Google to do? Uh, as a person who is using a free version of Google Workspace um, for a domain that I've had for quite some time, but I poured it through, you know, the, the Google... Uh, experience. Uh, I was very confused by this. I still am a little bit confused. I understand the timeline of like, here's what you got to do. Uh, it's not a free ride anymore, Sarah. You have to figure out like, yeah, what is, do you have a, you know, enterprise need, which I don't really, it's just me. Um, do you have some sort of, you know, is, is the Google workspace option? Uh, does it make sense for you? You have all these add-ons. Most of them I don't need either, but some people do. So I get that. A lot of folks have very different reasons for being in this kind of limbo um, mode that I, I find myself in as well. I'm also not scrambling because it's like I kind of have till September, right, to like figure things out. But it is pretty convoluted. I'm not totally sure what my option is. And my option, if I were to say, you know what, I'm just going to move from Google, what would that be? Well, oh. yeah. Uh, if 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 you you you'd have to go to Proton Mail or or Microsoft. Yeah, I mean there uh, are options, bigger. but like it's, there's other things. But it, yeah, yeah, it's just when you're so used to this, it's like. And oh, man. is it just you? Uh, on this particular domain, it yeah. is. Yeah. So, six, I'm not so that's six dollars per month. That's that's your other op is to say just pay six dollars per yeah, month. Yeah, which and is keep not it. the end of the world. Yeah. Uh, it's just and, something where I was like, I just never thought I would be here. Okay. Well, what's funny about this is that so much of Google's initial offering into consumer services were really to undercut Microsoft. If you think about email, docs, and enterprise level stuff like what we're seeing with this, they have since then realized that there is a profit center here, especially on the, on the enterprise level where Microsoft continues to make so much of their money. 
Uh, what's interesting to me is that they don't just let these early adopters ride. I can't imagine how many of them they are. I can't imagine that the conversion rate they're going to get out of this would even be a, a rounding error or of, of a rounding error of a rounding error on the balance sheet for, for alphabet. But then again, this is a company that has never been afraid to piss off early adopter nerds. Elsewise, they would not still have the dripping blood of Google reader on their hands. <laughs> I, I think what happens sometimes is when a, a, a population uh, of users gets small enough, it just becomes annoying to the engineers. They're like, why are we maintaining this for this number of people? Uh, and that's what pushes them to be like, let's just get rid of it. There's not that many people using it anyway. But you got to remember, those people are loud. Uh, I look at this and I, I'm split. Part of me thinks like, look, you had plenty of time. You, you got to realize you got to pay. On the other hand, Google should have done better communications in the intervening 10 years. Continually, they should have been emailing you saying like, hey, you're on a free tier. We're not kicking you off yet, but this won't last forever. Yeah, so, keep you it know, in mind. Gotta, you got to keep that top of mind. I mean, they did tell people, but the Kim and PA in our, our Twitch chat was like, I never saw it. So, you know, you got to you got to realize, like, if you don't want people to be angry, you have to make sure they know and then give them a give them an easier way to transition beyond a business level account. Because a lot of people doing this, were doing it for family. They're doing it for personal reasons like Sarah, where they had just been trying it out and it never went away. So so make it easier for those people to either switch to the free service and keep all their data and services or provide like a mid-level plan. Like we're going to start charging three bucks for this one. OK, you know. I don't know. There, there's got to be a, a a couple other things they could do to keep people from getting upset. If if, if this part of their business gave a rat's patoot about uh, uh, the goodwill of, of of an average customer, it's not going to pay at least six dollars a month. Then maybe they would, but they don't. I mean, I All will right. say I never saw one email about this. Maybe I'll get one. Um, I've been looking. But you, you know, you get enough spam spam through the Gmail interface alone that I could see a lot of this um, reaching out of Google being like, "We're giving you ample time to figure out your next." You know, if you want to pay us, great. If you want to move away, great. And people saying, "I never saw this because I didn't." Yeah, I don't think this is a big enough audience for it to be a cash grab either. I see. I I think it no. was uh, uh, Skelly saying, "I haven't received." Or no, it was. Uh, uh, someone saying, my guess is their revenue from other sources is dropping. That's not motivated. This isn't, no, no, this no. isn't a revenue. This is, this is them buttoning up a, a unbuttoning. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is checking a, a thing off a list. All right, let's check out our mailbag. Let's do it. James from Columbus, Ohio, wrote in and said, Netflix making new gaming announcements right after a Netflix price hike makes me feel that the two are related. I would gladly pay less for a service that did not include gaming. I wish they broke out the gaming part in into an added fee instead of increasing the cost for everybody, even though even if we have no interest in their gaming service. I'm currently on Netflix hiatus, and this makes me drag my feet even slower about coming back. Uh, is this is it the recency bias where when when two things happen in succession you see causality you, whether it's yeah, there you, or not? You, yeah, you wonder yeah. if that's why. I, I think, I, and that's that's it's perfectly normal human behavior. I have to fight against that all the time to be like this happened after that. I wonder if the first one caused the second one. I don't think that's the case here, James. Uh, the the if if they deducted the amount of money that the games are co costing them per user from your account, you wouldn't notice. Uh, the true reason for the price increase is the cost of their video programming. Total global spending on TV and movie content is supposed to hit $230 billion this year, and Netflix is the third largest investor in video content, uh, and they're trying to keep ahead of Disney. Uh, they're trying to keep ahead of Comcast, NBC. Uh, they also hit a subscriber plateau. Netflix just announced before the show they added 8.3 million subscribers, and they were expected to add 8.5 million. Uh, they, they missed their target, and their stock price dropped. So that's where that price increases going. They have to make more money per user right now because they're not gaining them as fast and they need to keep spending money on content to stay competitive. Yeah, D don't 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 blame the games, James. Uh blame all of the players. The dramas and comedies that you're not <laughs> watching. Uh ask for a deduction of those and you might see something different in your bill if they ever offered such a thing, which they will not. Nope. Uh, well, if you have feedback on anything that we talk about on the show, anything we might talk about on a future show, you have ideas, you have concerns, questions, 
All of those things should be sent to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love your feedback. Keep it coming. We also would like to thank a brand new boss. That brand new boss's name is John Wiggy Wilganowski. Just started backing us on Patreon. If I can call you Woogie, I'd like to thank you, Woogie. Woogie on, John. Excellent. Whoop, Good to whoop, have whoop. you. Whoop, whoop. Also, thanks to Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. What have you drawn today, Len? Well, you know, I am kind of with Sarah in that whole idea where I don't I don't really see why is he, me using a wise ear and clenching my my jaw, I'm 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 at that age now where I feel like that could be very detrimental to my health. Uh, I do find it very interesting, but it seems more of kind of a way to break up frustration, right? Uh, so that's what this image uh, uh, shows. It's uh, are you frustrated? Well, you know, work it out with Tom's top five. It's a playlist that lets you clench your jaw, skip, and pause, and you can kind of take a look. So I don't know. I just <laughs> you put, this person you put hates my five Adele, favorite BTS, bands on there, and the person yeah. is Imagine Dragons it. the Weekend, but loves Slayer. Like I Slayer, see where, I see yes. where you're going with this. And line. tolerates Boodle Deedle Do, is which is a which is on the playlist <laughs> as well, which is very interesting. And hates walnuts, is you know, it's kind of strange. But uh, yeah, I I um is I walnuts don't know. A, a band or just the nuts? <laughs> it's just walnuts in general. Doesn't Got like it. it okay. you know, it's like crunchy. Yeah. On them. You wouldn't be the only one. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, this, if you're interested in this piece, this is uh, uh, not only did I draw this on Twitch today at my Twitch <laughs> channel, but you can get this at my P Patreon, patreon.com forward slash line if you're a backer there, or if you're just a traditional person like to send me money, uh, go to my online store, lenperaltostore.com, and you can purchase this and, uh, and, and work out some of those frustrations, people. That's the way you got to do it with Wax here. Oh, good stuff as always, Len. Everybody, uh, take care of your jaws, uh, no matter what kind of music you like or don't like. Uh, but yeah, good good stuff. Uh, poor frustrated crunch guy. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Robert Young, also thanks to you for being with us today. Uh, Thursday usual. Uh, what's been going on since we saw you last? Well, uh, the Biden administration turned one. And so we take a look back at uh, the year that was in the new president's term and uh, where he might go forward. It's all in a brand new episode of Politics, 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 available everywhere you get a podcast tomorrow morning. Well, we sure thank both of you for being on the show with us today. Reminder for everybody, we're live doing this Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we will be back doing it all again tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>